afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Philip Bateman, bravo, Charlie here at the Australia China Business Council, Greater Bay Area. And I'm here with Nicholas Henderson, who's the director of the China Practice for Asia Link Business. Nicholas, you just took us through a, quite a remarkable session with a number of speakers. The Greater Bay Area for people watching at home. Do tell. Okay. Um, look, it's, it's, we, we know of uh, the Pearl River Delta as a geographic region in southern China, which is really a hub of, or traditionally a hub of manufacturing uh, throughout the Guangdong province. Uh, we've got technology hubs in Shenzhen, we've got advanced manufacturing in many different parts of the region, but obviously now with the Greater Bay Initiative it's all about integrating the region as, as one market, um, you know, integrating logistically between Hong Kong, Macau and the region, but also opening up those value chains between those different cities. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's another spearhead initiative by President Xi Jinping. It's a policy of uh, I like to call it opening up and reform 2.0, mm. uh, which is taking China's 40 years of opening up and reform, and then taking it to the next generation with policies like Made in China 2025, uh, integration of Tianjin, Beijing, and the region, um, and and also uh, you know the the development of the integrated Greater Bay Region as well. So. It's important for uh, businesses to understand the opportunities, uh, to understand the policies, to understand how to make those relevant for them, and hence we had the discussion today to learn a little bit more uh, to kind of start to dig down into some of those details. When you said understand the opportunities that are present in the Greater Bay Area, yep. what would some of those be? Uh, look, I think uh, there's, there's a number of them. I think uh, the, the region is trying to position itself as a technology hub. So Shenzhen is known as the, the Silicon Valley of hardware, so semiconductors, electronic equipment. Uh, you've got the world's largest commercial drone manufacturer in Shenzhen. Uh, you've got Tencent, you've got Huawei, you've got ZTE, obviously in the telecommunications equipment um, manufacturers that are leading the world. Uh, so you've got that very strong technological base um, linked to then the manufacturing and value chains in Dongguan, and in Guangdong, and then to to a lot of the high-end intellectual property and design and financing and logistics through Hong Kong. So you can see how there's that, that opportunity to really enhance that value chain. But as a region of 65 million people, it's an incredibly powerful consumer base. Uh, and for companies that are looking to identify markets uh, to start to sell their products in China, uh, looking at some of the discrete markets within the Greater Bay Area mm. or the Greater Bay Area using one market as a springboard is a good way to then scale consumer opportunities because it's a very large and, and sophisticated consumer base within that region. Yeah. And you were talking about then since uh, almost 40 years, 1978 yeah. when this sort of the, the big reform took off for want of a better term. Um, I remember being over in manufacturing precincts in two, tier two cities which were really starting to be at a point of stagnation maybe about 10 years ago now and uh, sitting down with local governors who were saying you know we need to how do we bring entrepreneurship how do we bring innovation into our cities as we've been a nation of people who make excellent copies of things it's culturally it is calligraphy it's the, the perfect copy to me is the height of Chinese culture so how do they reshape that and it sounds like industry two sorry reform 2.0 um, as you've been suggesting, is the way to do that. The complexity of making that happen, you touched on various levels that need to work together for that to happen. Could you talk to that? Yeah, look, I think always the challenge with some of these initiatives, and it was touched on by Danny Armstrong, if you look at the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone mm. uh, as a concept uh, and what it was trying to achieve, uh, they're often very broad initiatives uh, and objectives, but when it comes to actually implementing those at a grassroots level um, through customs, taxation, through all of the approvals processes, sometimes things can get lost in translation. So the, the, the challenge and the opportunity in the Greater Bay Area is how Hong Kong, Macau governments work with Shenzhen municipality, Guangdong province, local governments within those jurisdictions to try and make as many elements of doing business regulation, approvals, finances, as seamless as possible. Uh, and from indications from Andrew Whitford and, and some of the comments he made on the studies that he has conducted, is that there seems to be that collaborative approach to developing this concept. Um, and, and hopefully that will bear fruit when it comes to rolling it out. And what do you find fascinating about this? 
look, uh, look. I think uh, as an observer of uh, China's uh, economic miracle and and actually uh, having been to China sort of for the last twenty years and the majority of that time actually living in in market, seeing the reform unfold um, and having bear, bearing witness to some of that throughout the country. Uh, and I guess the current economic and social challenges that the country is facing and then now the policy frameworks and initiatives that are being put in place to deal with the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, this is why I think when, when we're talking about Belt and Road, when we're talking about initiatives like Made in China 2025 and when we're talking about uh, the Greater Bay Area, it's so important for us to understand these narratives because linked to these policies is initiatives, is funding, is development of ecosystems, is development of opportunities. And the more that we understand about the economic uh, narrative in China, the better we can as Australian businesses get plugged into where the opportunities are. And I predominantly work in the manufacturing, advanced manufacturing industrial and the ag uh, agricultural space. And when I hear Made in China 2025, I understand, I mean, a lot of my manufacturing uh, company clients are obviously manufacturing in China, they simply bring the know-how over there. What challenges are they going to face? Like what's on the cards for Australian manufacturing businesses in relation to Made in China 2025? Uh, look, I think um, the policy uh, brings some challenge. Uh, it also brings a really strong amount of opportunity. So on the one, one side you've got China trying to go up the scale as being a uh, an advanced manufacturer and going through different stages of industrialization. It's, uh, it's sort of at the latter stages of its industrialization to being an industrialized nation. Um, and it has the objective uh, to build its technological capabilities across a number of different domain areas from transportation to new energy, new materials, many, many different areas. Uh, and that's all leveraging the power of the internet and technology and internet of things. Mm. Um, so. Part of that, though, is, is China increasing the proportion of domestically produced technologies that goes into China-produced products. And that will be ramped up from a target of 40%, I think, in the next five, five odd years, all the way up to 70% within a period of time. So it is going to mean that there's going to be a lot more indigenous Chinese innovation. Uh, then the opportunity on the flip side is uh, there is going to be a need to be a lot of collaboration. There's going to need to be a lot of... Uh, collaborative projects, sharing of IP through the right mechanisms, mm. uh, sharing of expertise and know-how uh, to enable that because they're very lofty, ambitious mm. targets. Um, even if you're looking at training and education, there's going to need to be skills development to enable uh, such a such a, a wide-ranging uh, uh, policy like Made in China 2020 mm. or 25 to be realised. And how does Asia Link Business, just in our closing minute, fit into all this? So we, we're Australia's national centre for Asia capabilities, uh, and we have a mandate to build an Asia-capable Australia, which means to build the skills, the knowledge and the insights to enable businesses to have success in the market, but to have more informed and more quality and hopefully more profitable outcomes when they're dealing with markets like China. So we, um, we run a number of courses in, in, to build education and capability, uh, we also do research to build knowledge. Uh, we also do um, advisory and consulting to help businesses to build approaches into markets. So we're all about building the skills and knowledge and insights which enable um, companies to, 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 to actually access and then to leverage some of these China opportunities and more broadly opportunities in Asia. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.